So finally a discussion. So those of you who would be uh, thinking to, to ask Thank questions, you. You, are, you will be uh, most welcome to ask our questions. If you don't have questions, I have plenty of questions and it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's my weakness to ask questions. Um, so I hope we have a good discussion. Now the main, the main uh, topic of our discussion or the main goal of our discussion is to see uh, and look at the space industry and compare it maybe with other industries that are also looking for investments. Uh, we know that the space industry is probably the most deep or deep, deep tech uh, um, uh, way of uh, innovations, very deep innovations. So there, of course, are challenges and this is what we want to address. This is something that we want to discuss. So we will start uh, the discussion, but actually before you have your rowing up in questions, um, uh, I actually want to start with one particular question to, to Martinj because he is the person who hasn't been involved with space industry. All the other speakers have been here uh, and, and deeply involved with the space industry. Martin, maybe for you, a person who hasn't had experience with the space sector, what is your first impression or feeling uh, if somebody for to you as an investor would come up and say, hey, I have a, an idea for uh, space technologies, what, what would be your first reaction? Um. Hello, good day. Um, I have to start with disclaimer. I'm, I'm also a limited partner of commercialization reactor. So, and so there is some knowledge about <laughs> space industry, so I, I can't say that I have no clue about space industry. But uh, in the same time, I guess uh, space industry is just one specific industry from investor shoes. Uh, investors always will start to understand about whether there is team which understands what they are doing, whether there is market uh, reasonable and wh whether there is some um, metrics behind of understanding of business and, and clients. So from that perspective, I would not say that there is something uh, unique or, or whatever. It doesn't matter whether this is underwater or... or Up in the water. <laughs> next to the sky. So. <laughs> yes. Very good. Thank you. I think this is a very good uh, insight uh, to hear that more and more investors are looking at the space sector just as another, another way how to, to serve the customers, find the customers and, and create products that they need. So that's, that's good to hear. So based on that, maybe to start off our discussion on general on, on how is it available, maybe um, all of you could, um, could, could share your experience or, or your idea. Do you, do you believe that uh, there's enough funding available, uh, and before you say no, <laughs> before you say no, uh, please maybe elaborate on that. So is there enough funding uh, in terms of global, how the global space industry develops and how we compare the space industry to other sectors? So do you believe that there's enough funding for, for generating new space technologies? Maybe we'll, we'll start here with this side. Peter, since, since you have the most of the white here, so you have <laughs> so, uh, so, so we start with you. Okay, that's a, that's a very funny way to put, to put it, uh, Paul. So, <laughs> I have to start somewhere. I, uh, no, you're absolutely right. Um, I think that there, is, uh, that there is always plenty of money for, for very good ideas. Uh, I think that if you compare Europe with, uh, with the States, then it is clear that there is there's more money, there's more appetite inside the States, the US, to, let's say, to invest in, uh, in new companies. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly sure, let's say, that if there, is, uh, if there are very good ideas in, inside, inside Europe, uh, from the, uh, from the, the startups, uh, the scale-ups, and the SMEs, that, that they can have uh, so, uh, access to adequate funding. Great. Okay. Let's go on. Well, I don't want to compare Europe to other countries. I think we have to find our own way. And uh, I would say that I do believe that, and I'm very glad to see it, in the new space arena, we are getting more and more funding and more and more interest from private investors, actually, especially to invest in new space disruptive innovations. Uh, I believe that we do 
have to open more opportunities for Central Eastern European countries, actually, because not all of them have this national support, governmental support, like big countries like in Germany and France. A lot of uh, Central Eastern European countries are just uh, starting to do <coughs> innovation, but despite of the fact that they don't have the governmental support, there are a lot of new space companies emerging, and I think investors should be looking at them, because this means that these are resilient companies which can survive in complex environment. Thank you, Stella. Stephen. Well, first I think the question is a little bit how long is a piece of string? <laughs> so it's a very difficult question to answer globally, and I, you have to break it down into smaller segments uh, and look at it in, uh, in different chunks. I certainly agree that in the Central and uh, Eastern European countries there is more of a challenge. Generally, these countries do not have their own space agencies and national funds. And this is, for sure, a big barrier for people entering and starting up. And one of the reasons why we have schemes like the RPA program here in Latvia, which is intended to fill that gap and act as the space agency uh, for, for that nation. Uh, so there, there are some opportunities. But then you come down to country by country, looking at is there enough uh, funding for the space development in that country to be able to achieve the, uh, the goals uh, of the space strategy for that country and to be able to support private enterprise and uh, the new space. And that is highly variable across the different countries. Here we see a very, very wide difference in the amount of investment that is going into space. Then if we look at the uh, ESA programs and new startups trying to get into a high reliability ESA program rather than a short duration new space type program, there's another level of challenges that they need to address. Uh, and, a, and this opens up also some critical funding areas that are difficult and where there are, in my opinion, there need to be um, more funding opportunities. So we have plenty of funding opportunities, I think, maybe not with enough money in each of them, but plenty of funding opportunities, different sources, to be able to assess the feasibility of your idea. Uh, also, if you look at the RPA program that, I, that I'm running here, to be able to assess the market and the requirements, uh, and knowing the market is key to be able to uh, attract private investment and being able to demonstrate that, coming up with the business plan. But then, by the time you want to go to TRL 5 or 6, there is an inescapable need for infrastructure in your, uh, in your company. And this, there are not really government, or there's not ESA programs that will pay for that infrastructure for you. So there need to be other funding sources, and this can be quite a roadblock for a number of uh, companies, in my view, and one of the areas where really there should be some, some further support. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Martin, can you add something on this? Uh, I think we, we should look to any kind of development from a uh, nature perspective. We could compare uh, this, for instance, space industry with uh, sport. Uh, we know that, that people play basketball already a long time ago. But, for instance, uh, 30 years ago, floorball was not known in, 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 in this region at all. Uh, they invented in Sweden, uh, Sweden that. But after 15 years, in most of the Latvia small cities, we are playing floorball. So, idea is that if there are some people who are bringing into the, some territory some knowledge, passion, and then build on that with investment in infrastructure around those people, then there could be more and more follow-up investments, activities, etc. So that means tradition, people, and access to infrastructure. In the same with space. 
if we are talking about money, then we should understand what infrastructure we have in place in region. And that's clear. It's, it's very narrow uh, niche activities which we could link to those infrastructure perspectives. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Maya, uh, what do you think uh, with, with the whole big experience of, uh, of Israel in developing space technologies and infrastructure, do you still believe there's more need for more uh, investments in the, into the sector? If, if I think we need more money for that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, first of all, of course, <laughs> we need a lot of money. But I must say that money... We, we can find the mo money all the time. I mean, if you bring a good idea, if the team is a great team, this is something that we are looking at, then the money will be found. And of course, when we speaking about, it's not an uh, internet application, okay? It's this, the new space. The ROI here, it's really long shot. It's not something that will be in one or two years. So when we speak about those segments like also like medical, also in the medical, it's really long shot. Then the government must put a, at least matching money, okay? We, you, we don't believe that the, uh, the private uh, market will manage by itself. So <coughs> there is money, but of course the government should put also money. Great, great, thank you. Um, I've, st I've finished the first round of questions, so if anybody has a question, so you can please raise your hand. We can provide you with a microphone, and then you can ask directly the questions. I don't see many hands going up. No, not yet. Very good. More questions to me, so I'm, I'm more happy with that. So um, now, now we would maybe, I, I like actually what, what Steven said uh, in his intro about separating uh, private funding and, and, and public funding for space sector. But um, any of you who feel, feel so, maybe you could share what do you think for space technologies? Uh, what should be the right path from, from the idea to some research, to some innovation, to the product, to actual application? So what should be really, who should be the biggest players? Uh, I think Maya correctly said, if there's a good idea, there will be money. And that's, that's a good message to all of us. There will be money if you have a good idea. So how do you think in the space sector, and, and, and we are talking not about marketing ideas or application ideas, we're talking a hardcore technologies. So what would you say is, is the most optimal path? Nobody is born with, with a great idea, you know, in the morning you wake up and, oh, I have a great idea, I will be building rockets and, and you have money for that, right? So you should start with something. So um, can you share from your experience, so what should be the right path uh, for, for actually going through this uh, process of getting to the product? Anybody? I can say how it works in Israel. Yes, the, okay, the, the companies that we work with. Uh, so first of all, you have, you, you really need good idea, okay? So <laughs> where does the idea should come from? Uh, most of the time when you disrupt the market, we think really creativity and uh, most of the time and a lot with the academic research that you see, okay, I have a really achieve, a big achievement in, in, in one uh, segment and I, uh, most of the time they take the achievement and transfer it to other segment, like if it's in medical, they can transfer it to the space. Or I, I actually I showed a, a company in Israel that make production for medicine in the space. So everything it's like you can be asked about, you can doubt anything. In Israel, it's really, we like to disrupt the market. We doubt everything, everything that it's like, okay, this is, this is the way it works. No, in Israel, we question, we have question about everything. So when you think you find the, the uh, great idea, then it's the time to build a great team. And from my perspective and from what I know and the way we work, when you have good, good, good a winner team, this is really, it's like 60% of the, of the total that you're looking if to invest in a startup or not. Because most of the startups along the way will do pivot. If they start with one idea, 
they will change the idea because the, the market is too hard, because uh, the idea was not too good, because many, many, many reasons. And if the team is good, is uh, working really, really good in a good way, then they will achieve the, the goal and will achieve a um, success. And if not, there's so much uh, obstacles along the way, then it might not work. Good. So, so team and idea. Okay. Yeah. Somebody wants to add that on that? Yes. Steven? Oh, no. Stella. I'm sorry. Go on, Stella. Stella goes first. Well, I, I think uh, also the opportunity to start, I, I do agree, having an excellent idea, but also having on the institutional side, for example, programs like our EIC Pathfinder, which gives opportunities to consortium of companies to do disruptive breakthrough innovation. For, for example, they can get funding up to four million, but then after TRL4, to have the opportunity to enter, to reach your proof of concept, to do early commercialization also, to start thinking about it already from TRL4 to TRL6. So I think that's very important to have these opportunities like this fundaments, no matter what type of technologies you're developing. Steven. So I, I think there's two different directions. So what we've heard so far is ground up ideas. Uh, I think the cross-pollination is really, it is indeed that's where you get most of the ideas. But there is also the top-down approach. So in ESA we're trying to do demanding missions that nobody has ever done before. Big complex missions like going to JUICE which was launched, uh, going to Jupiter with JUICE that was launched uh, last week. <laughs> now, if you're trying to do something that has never been done before, you start to work through the systems engineering of that and you realize there are parts of that problem and system that you don't have solutions for. Uh, and we make this rather well known. Uh, we have roadmaps and we have a harmonization process and these roadmaps identify what technologies we don't have that we think we're going to need in the future to be able to uh, enable our new missions. So uh, as well as having bottom up, there is also uh, a, a key role for, for top-down. The benefit of the top-down is that you know that if you solve that problem, you have a market. But the market might be very small and niche. The benefit with the bottom-up is that you maybe target, uh, have a breakthrough technology that is more widely uh, applicable across a range of platforms and therefore provides you with a, a broader, more solid business. However, in this case, I also am working with a lot of startups. The biggest two mistakes that I, that I find, that I see, is not being aware of who your competition is and what your competing products are. So you have a nice idea, but you don't know what it's trying to replace. So how, if you don't know that, how are you ever going to develop a winning product? This is really key. And the second is having uh, a combined product and business development plan to understand what are all of the steps that they're going to have to do, also the non-technical steps that they're going to have to do to take that from being an idea to being a successful recurring product. And startups, in my experience, tend to overly focus on the technical side of it neglecting this business development, product development side, uh, and ne neglecting the environment in which they are competing. Good, good. We'll come back to the startups. I am still want to focus on, on this uh, way and, and process of getting the ideas. Peter, you, you, you have some insights? Uh, let's say, you, let's say it, you, your question was concerning, let's say, that how you get from something very small to something very, very um, at big. Little li at least a little bit bigger. Yeah, yeah. let's say that. And I think, let's say that if you take a look on the on the European scale, that, uh, let's say I had to, I had the pleasure to work uh, often with the company OHB in, uh, in in Germany, and that company started as uh, with a uh, six uh, persons outfit in the garage in uh, in Bremen, and uh, this has now been uh, become let's say one of the uh, one of the big LSIs inside inside Europe. 
So I think, let's say, what you need for a, for a startup uh, to grow, in addition to what was mentioned uh, by the other panelists, but I think you need to have, you need to have talent, you need to have uh, the sense of speed, let's say, to, to be there. You need to have passion. I think let's say, that's something which is very important. And also you need to have capital so to convince uh, investors to, to share your ID. So let's say, I think that these are important ingredients. Another example, you have to be very intuitive. Um, uh, let's say I was um, uh, moderating a panel in Dubai and uh, there we had uh, uh, an Israeli entrepreneur, uh, Stemrat. And uh, let's say that uh, I talked a lot with him. Let's say that he was sitting on the panel together with an Emirati, the head of the space missions. And he had a very interesting idea. Let's say he said, I said, how did you get into, into space? He said, I was not in space at all. He was in the, uh, he was um, a radiation uh, expert and he was contacted by the Japanese, let's say after the Fu Fu Fukuyami uh, disaster. And so he had, he had developed protective clothing. And then thereafter, he came in contact with, uh, uh, with, uh, with people from NASA, and he said, Let's, but radiation is also in space. Uh, so why shouldn't, uh, why shouldn't I also offer this possibility then to, uh, to, to NASA? Now, with the first uh, SLS-1 launch of Artemis, there were the two specimen, let's say, which were having uh, millions of sensors on it, and he has created uh, quite, an, uh, quite a big job. But let's say, of course, this was done with a lot of support from the Israeli Space Agency. Also, DLR, I think, has been very much involved. But uh, let's say it also shows that, uh, let's say, a sense of, uh, of stepping in into the right moment and talking with the right people and passion. I think let's say, that's something which is an, an absolute ingredient if you want to become successful as, an, uh, as a startup company. Great. Thank you, Peter. Martin, you wanted to add? Yeah, I like to really manage this top-down, bottom-up bottom uh, idea behind how you look to the, the, the project or startup. And that uh, allows me also to think in that way that uh, if there is mission to complete something, bigger task, which is long-term, future, or whatever, then it's clear that you are looking to this as a project where there should be find some financing which will support to complete this mission and etc. But if there is the idea, whatever stage it comes from or whatever, from the, from the army, from the science or whatever, idea which would serve certain market as, as the potential disruption or whatever, then this is totally different. Then you look to idea to the team and you are looking for investors which could finance whether government or, or private investors, whatever. But if this is mission where you should complete some task, then look to this as the project, not to the business. Very good. Thank you. Uh, any questions? No. Very good. So, so again, more questions to me. Yes. Uh, thank you for, thank you for uh, highlighting this. Um, I really like up on top down, up uh, top-down, button-up <laughs> approach uh, for that. I still want to, before we move a little bit, since we have some time, um, I still want to challenge you a little bit on, on uh, the way how we can actually come to the ideas. Uh, we always talk about you need a passion, which I totally agree, and most of the people here have passion for space and everything. But uh, from our experience, at least here in Latvia, there is always a problem that there are scientists, who have the, the knowledge and who can solve the problems, radiation protection or whatever, but scientists are not the ones who would go out, even if they have a passion for space, they would not go out. They would not understand if, the, if, the, if we ask them what is the market need for that, they would crash down and control all delete. Yes. So it's, it's always a problem with that. So, so to actually find the idea with the space sector, where, which, which still requires a lot of, uh, lot of uh, science, a lot of engineering, you, you can't, you know, as again, I will give the example, waking up in the morning or after a big party, you cannot come up with a, hey, I will have this great uh, radiation protection or something, right? You need some kind of interaction between those who have technical scientific capabilities and those who have the capabilities of actually uh, finding the market need, finding. So from your experience, what do you think is the best way how to get those 
opposing competencies together? What, what are the instruments? How, how to get them running? Anyone? I, I can go. I can describe at least the process that we are typically following in the schemes that I am uh, looking after. And usually we'll find that we go and visit a, com uh, a country and we'll have business to business meetings. And they will come to us and say, look, we have this type of technology that we think should have an application in space, but when, yeah, we're not really sure. We think it could be used for this or that, but they're not really sure. Uh, it's very rare that they have the technology and the application perfectly matched in that first conversation. But that's where, where we step in and start to try to have that discussion process with them of understanding the technology that, that they have, that they've developed, what's new about it, what can it do that other competing technologies cannot do, and matching that with what we do in space, the products that we typically buy, the, the, the technologies we typically use. And then we tend to put them in touch with uh, certainly better experts than me, uh, who can have a very detailed discussion about specific applications of that, which may then lead to uh, an idea for starting to do preparatory work and preparatory funding cool. to investigate the feasibility and concept of an idea. Uh, will it work against that target that uh, the expert has said there could be a good uh, need for? and exploring the potential market and, again, the potential uh, competitors in detail while they're doing that to understand, well, what would be their unique selling points and what would be their main drawbacks. Cool. And that's the sort of yep. process that we try to follow. So, in, in a way, we could say ESA is a, is a great partner for actually cross-checking if the technology has a use case or, or there's a need for that techno yep. technology or competence in the space already for existing companies who already have some experience. Correct? Uh, yes, yeah, yep. uh, exactly. Okay. At least and I would say that because I'm from ESA, so... <laughs> Stella. Well, actually, uh, in the EIC, the way we uh, have these activities is with proactive program management from the program managers. So we, as program managers, in a similar way as ESA, meet the projects and understand what are the technologies which they develop, the products and services. We do regularly have these portfolio meetings where... Uh, program managers actually lead and encourage that type of interactions. And sometimes it arrives that projects, uh, different companies from Accelerator, high TRL, partner with low TRL, and they apply for different type of funding and so on. Because one of the tasks of the program manager is to encourage the ecosystem, to encourage the building of the ecosystem, but not uh, in the ecosystem, in the uh, looking at customers, partners, suppliers, building the whole value chain. Cool. Martin, you wanted to add? I guess always the best case scenario is when there is some entrepreneur with vision. In 2001, I guess, Elon Musk started his SpaceX project because he had some idea about potential global scale of uh, making business more uh, uh, business driven <laughs> in, in, in space industry, right? And then he found out right technical people, whatever, scientists or from, from industry. But if the idea about technology is first and second is, is, is entrepreneurship, then, then definitely team is the answer. So, if there is leader within the team with the understanding what means to create a team, and then there is enough knowledge about market validation and about the technology <coughs> and about uh, project management, those three things together, then there is potential to, to go forward in right time right uh, speed and, 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 and have some, some progress. So from that perspective, again, those are basics. 
Cool. Yeah, I think, thank you, Martin. I think it's, it's a very important aspect that you brought up and why I'm torturing you about this idea process because in, in Latvia we have a very good and very strong and long for decades uh, and decades uh, competencies built on academic level where we have been part of uh, space missions during the Soviet Union time and, and we have institutes and scientists who've been working on crazy and crazy technologies but, but they're struggling a lot to actually commercialize, to bring them into actual product. And, and having people, young people, who have the maybe passion for the space and having a Elon drive, <laughs> yeah, they, they, they could then with this drive actually find the right, the right people from the academia. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Maya. Yeah. Um, again, a perspective from Israel. So in Israel, in Israel the, the thing is that it's, we have the scientists, of course, but most of this uh, segment comes from the military, military market. And in Israel, we have a lot of companies, like uh, military companies, that are making huge projects. And they have uh, scientists, and they have, uh, they, I mean, the, the knowledge that they have there is really a major one. And they also have employees that are young engineers. And when they, uh, can see all the technologies that they're developing in these uh, companies, in this market, when they have an idea, they just step out of the military uh, uh, company and actually establish a startup. So this is also a... Good, good. Okay, uh, Steven Martin. Okay. Steven, you go. Your uh, uh, for, for me, the, um, one of the key things that I've seen in specifically addressing the issue of getting good technology out of universities is that you, you mentioned you need pe entrepreneurs and people with a vision, but you need people with the confidence and belief in themselves, and they need to go for it 100%. It's not something that you can do half-heartedly. Okay. Uh, you really have to go for it because it's going to cost you, however, <laughs> however brilliant you are, it's going to cost you a lot of energy to get something from an idea to a working profitable business. Yeah. It's not an, an easy task, it's not something you do in your spare time as a hobby, so you have to commit to it fully. There are some models in some countries where there are universities and research institutions who are set up to encourage this to happen uh, in a better way than in some other countries. So it is also good for the university um, and the, the research institutes to have some pressure from the government to generate spin-off companies and then to go and look around Europe at who is doing a good model of that. There are some good models in Belgium, actually, and there are some good models in Switzerland. Uh, IMEC, I'm thinking in particular, has been particularly successful at, at that sort of thing. And to take the good elements of, of these good models and apply them to the institutes here in Latvia in, uh, yep. in the other countries because indeed there is um, a wealth and a history of very good detailed technical and scientific research but there is not in many of these companies countries the spin-off culture and the spin-off support to get them out and enable people to feel confident to have the courage of their convictions and just go for it. Okay, we'll come back to government. Martin, you had a quick... Just one add-on as, as, as uh, experience of Israel uh, about the great importance of army uh, in economy. It's the same story uh, from, from Finland. They also have mandatory army and, and a service. And, and I know uh, uh, from startup uh, scene, a lot of teams where boys are coming from totally different professional perspective and, and they mix and they create great teams. So what I can say that we need more joint uh, infrastructure for beer drinking in universities to people put <laughs> together and maybe... Finally somebody said it. Yes, and maybe, and, and that's good that we creating those camps, etc. The, the great teams uh, could born there as well. And, and, and of course, uh, kind of uh, 
those paramilitary activities which are more and more in, in, in Baltic uh, countries as well, they also could help to bring totally different people together and, and start to talk about and, uh, and uh, implement some great ideas. Sure, thank you. Okay, uh, still no questions from the audience. Uh, I'm happy with that. So um, uh, let's go on uh, a little bit more, have a, uh, have a more detailed insight. Maybe we can uh, talk about how the government if, if we're already out of the process that, yes, we have uh, some startups and people and, and, and scientists and engineers, uh, what should be the role of governments uh, in, in, in supporting uh, the, the initialization of the process? How should governments should, uh, should sort of support startups? Peter, maybe we can start with you. I know you have expertise yep. and... and no, let's, let's say that I think this is a very, very good uh, question. Uh, let's say a couple of uh, months ago, I talked to the, uh, to the Australians. Australians. Uh, Australians, yeah. They have space industry in Australia. They've got, uh, they've got the space industry, which was in the past very much uh, dominated by the, by the LSIs from the States and uh, from Europe. And they have now established in a, a directive that whatever uh, is uh, produced uh, on, the, on, the, on the satellites, let's say that these LSIs, that they need to subcontract a lot of work to Australian-based companies. And if you take a look now in Australia, I think they've got 97% uh, of, the, of the total budget is now being allocated also, let's say, to, to, to SMEs and to smaller companies. So this is quite clearly an, an activity which can be taken at the governmental level that's to, to promote um, the inclusion of, uh, of smaller companies um, and also to make sure that the, uh, that the activities are staying within the, uh, within the country. Um, uh, I think that the other thing which, which I think is relevant to mention is that if you talk about the, uh, the, uh, the LSIs, uh, let's say that a lot of, uh, lot of uh, LSIs now also establish an, um, an, an, an hands-off um, uh, arrangement with startups. Uh, so let's say that to say, okay, fine. Let's say we uh, let's say we fund you. Let's say you let's say you uh, you get on with it. We, you don't have to follow our rules. Just have a very um, very um, uh, open approach. Let's say how you want to proceed. And I think that's uh, that's also important. And coming back to your question on the uh, on what the government can do. Uh, let's say if you take a look. Let's say what has been done now on a small scale with the RPA. Let's say this is really, let's say, the, the, for Latvia, that they invest with, I think, with 12 or 13 companies, that's the, that's the money is being put aside specifically going to, to, uh, to Latvian companies. So there's a lot of things which government uh, can do. Um. Yeah, so it's more like a coordinating uh, organ who, who is trying to get everyone together. Good. Um, um, we, we, we have uh, actually very limited time left, but uh, somebody is telling me that actually the SpaceX rocket is about to go on, or...? Yeah, 4.30. 4.30, okay, we, we have 10 more minutes. Uh, let's hope there. Actually, uh, I've talked uh, to some of the technicians that we can have a video in the background of, of rocket getting ready. Steven, you must be excited, right? Yeah, nobody else, nobody will be listening to us or watching us uh, yeah, that's fine, in the that's background, fine. but I might also not be listening to us <laughs> or, uh, okay, <laughs> or answer your questions. It's <laughs> actually there, Stephen, it's actually there. Uh, oh, but then well, we still got eight, eight minutes. minutes. Yeah, we have eight okay. minutes, very good, no stress, uh, relax everyone. Okay, guys, um, uh, really, um, the question is uh, if, if you would, and we have limited time before the launch, uh, if you would have suggest to, to people who are thinking or who are dreaming about the business in, in the space industry, who are dreaming and, and are not afraid to dream big as Elon Musk is uh, dreaming, what would you suggest them? Where to start? Going to pubs or, or going to parties or, or maybe going to Israel and talk with Israel? What, what would you suggest? Maya? May I say, say one thing about the government? Yes, okay? sure. Because I think it's very important. I can tell you that in Israel we have programs from school to the, to the kids in school. Uh, we have grants from the innovation authorities. We also can have a, ask a grants from Horizon, and I think that Horizon, of course, is also open for the Latvian people. So I think, uh, actually, in five years, we have 2,000 grants for Israeli startups from, from the Horizon. So I think it's an institute that you don't really familiar with. with and gives a lot of money for startups and entrepreneurs. And it's really important that, of course, 
you know, if it will live or alive or dead, it's only because of the money. So it's really important. As I said at the beginning, of course, good idea and good entrepreneurs will find the money, but there are grants that you should know about and they come to, to pick them. Um, it's really uh, important. And one last uh, thing, a uh, fail, it's not a failure, okay? And even if an uh, entrepreneur, young entrepreneur, establish a startup and it's fail, they are not a failure. They should try again. Very good. The second time they will, f they will succeed. Very good. Stella, you wanted? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually wanted to say that it's very important, that's one of the roles of the EIC to invest in high risk and breakthrough innovations, but it's not about the money. It's about the community also, about the support which they get from us, like business acceleration services, uh, access to markets, ac investors' days, roundtables. It's not yeah. only about the money. And then what I would say to SMEs and startups, whatever product or service in the space industry you develop, please definitely think from the customer, user-driven, customer-driven, because you want to commercialize it. And also, do not discourage and be very persistent. That's very important. It's, a, it's the whole ecosystem. It's exactly. Not only one thing, of course. Yeah. Good. Uh, Stephen, you wanted to add? Yeah, again, still on the what can the government do? Because there's one thing that we haven't discussed at all, uh, that I think is very important that the government does, and if they don't do it, I don't think there's any potential for any activity, and that's the focus on the education. You, uh, space, we say it's a very high-tech, cutting-edge area. A lot of our technologies are not so high-tech, they're not so cutting-edge, but the depth of knowledge that with which you need to know that technology, and the different ways you need to be able to understand and predict how that technology works in extreme and different environments. So that level of almost scientific knowledge of the engineering, this really sets it apart. And you cannot do that unless you have good engineering. And the more that you put uh, space engineering into the curricula and into the tertiary education, the more that I think you'll also encourage and give people the tool set to be able to do space startups. So education for me is one thing that the governments should really clearly be focusing on. Uh, on a side note, on a fun note, um, I, I came across in an interesting research on asking children what are the topics they find most exciting. And number one was, guess what? Dinosaurs. <laughs> but number two, was space, so <laughs> I think that's uh, that's a good reason how through space we can uh, inspire kids to not everyone will become astronauts, but everyone can be part of amazing space missions like we're going to hopefully see in 55 seconds. Anybody wants on a closing note say something in 50 seconds? I think yeah, Peter. What, uh, what, what Stella has said is uh, the, to, to be focused on the, on the end user. I think that's what is very important as a startup is that you is that you ask yourself, does my solution solve a problem of the end user? I think let's, that's something which is, you, which is absolutely, absolutely key to, uh, let's, to start with. Don't have any assumptions, focus on, the, focus on that one. And um, let's say, to, to, to end up let's say, with your first question, is there enough, enough money around? Um, uh, I think, let's say, that an, an, investors, an invest, uh, investor, a venture capitalist, that he, he prefers a good team with a bad ID than a bad, uh, uh, a bad ID with a good team. It's, um, cool. Martin? Just add final user, <coughs> customer, who would like to pay for this. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Um, uh, our time for, for this session is over. We have uh, uh, two minutes for the start. I hope they don't cancel it as they, as they did. But I think we did a very good uh, warm up for, for Elon. Uh, yeah, uh, we, will cross, we will cross fingers crossed. Can we actually get a little bit of sound? Yeah. On, uh, a lot of sound. Uh, no. No, we can't get sound from this video. But if you don't mind, actually, we, we still have two minutes until the launch. Um, 
let, let, let me ask you uh, maybe uh, just something that, uh, that you find. What are the, the, uh, the, the directions for the space technologies that you find the most promising, the most interesting to go on? Not everybody is going to build rockets, and Steven said you don't have to be super engineer, you can still find for those who are uh, passionate about the space. What would you say, what are those directions uh, that, that you find promising? I, I have two that I'm passionate about. I, I think that uh, in the future we're going to need new generations of rovers that are and autonomous machines that can work on other planets without needing to be told step by step what to do. This is a big challenge, a fun thing to work on, and there is plenty of opportunity to focus on that. Uh, and we have what I think will be the broader market, which is the use of spacecraft data for downstream applications to support uh, terrestrial industry. We've seen it already in farming, forestry, etc., uh, and it's making its way into governments, uh, and this is an area of significant growth. Cool, yeah, we will need those rovers not only on Mars, but here in our cities mm -hmm. as well. Peter? Uh, energy. 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 I think that's it. That uh, that's was also mentioned this morning when the top 10 was, uh, was being uh, presented. Uh, uh, energy <laughs> is let's, from space. I think let's say, it's something, maybe it's very difficult, uh, let's say very far-fetched at the moment, but there you talk about sustainable energy, which, uh, which, can, mm. which, which will be of key importance to the, uh, to the future. Great. Thank you. Uh, we'll launch. What with the What with the video? We don't they see They cancel it. it. <laughs> I want to add... In yes. space, solar energy harvesting, actually. Yes. <laughs> and Very also okay, servicing satellites in space. Oh. Okay, okay, 20 satellite. seconds. Aha. No, they stopped it again. The director has called a hold. We are recycling. For the moment, we'll see where they move the clock back to. They could hold at T-minus 40 seconds. <laughs> they could go to an earlier point. Give us a minute to listen into the nets, and we'll see if we can get you more information to share. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we still have time. Very good. To finish up, maybe, Maya, from, from your perspective, where do you find uh, the, the, the best directions for space technologies? The best what? Sorry. What, what do you think are the most potential uh, space technologies uh, to look into? Uh, you're talking about the technology? Which technology to choose? Yeah, like rovers directions. or energy. Directions. Actually, I don't know. I think this uh, market will grow exponential. exponential. And on every segment, it will be a major uh, increase. So I Good. think really... So, so even if you're one. an artist and if you're passionate about the space... You just go for it. I think that the, the segment that everyone going to, don't go there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Take yes. the opposite way. Very good. Um, I would like to thank all of the panelists here. I think we had a very good discussion. I uh, hope you got uh, some good ideas for yourself and uh, hope we have a future Latvian, Elon or Elons, uh, as we say, yes, uh, here. So thank you very much. Um, uh, let's give a round of applause to our panel.